Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today I'm doing something different. I'm obviously not going to be playing a scenario. So um, what I'm going to do is talk about the custom stuff I've made for my game and tell, give me an idea of how I put it all together. I've had some questions about the chips and stuff like that. So I'm just going to go through some stuff here. So the first thing I want to talk about is the tablecloth. It's just a piece of fabric. I did a Google search for World War II camo because I knew I wanted to have like a, a tablecloth that was some kind of camo, World War II ca era camel, ca camo. <laughs> so the original idea was I was going to have I was going to have this green on one side and this camo on the other, but I didn't want to just sew them together. So I figured it would just be like a big loose, uh, almost like a pillowcase or something. So I didn't want to do that. So. I found out that you can get this fabric here that you iron on and it gives this like a little heft. So I I thought I would iron this onto the green and then and then iron the camo onto that. But once I made this, I realized that it was like when I put it on the table, it doesn't hang over the side like this. So it's really kind of just stiff. It's like it's almost like it's too stiff to be a tablecloth. So in the end, I just scrapped that idea. I use this as an alternative sometimes if I need to wash this one or whatever. But um, and then so this one is just it came in this size and it's perfect for my table. It's an Ikea table. I forget the name, but it's the one that's square and then the leaf pulls out and then a leaf pulls out here. So the the tablecloth is a perfect size. And all I did was um, I just folded it over right where the color ends and then I got a piece of again another piece of like you iron it in there it's sticky on both sides you just put it under there and iron it and then it folds it and then I just ran a stitch the whole way just to kind of clean it up a little bit and then that little bit of banding gives it just enough heft to hang over the edge like that so um, I got the fabric from Spoonflower I don't remember the vendor's name or whatever, but I'll uh, I'll look it up and put a link to the description. So um, that's the that's the tablecloth, and I'll talk about the um, I'll talk about the chips next. Okay, so the chips they're uh, they're they're nice heavy poker chips. I think they're 11 gram, but um, the way the way I made these was, and I know they're too small to see here, but I'll I'll put some close up pictures of it so you know what I'm talking about. But I, what I did was uh, I bought blank chips from Amazon, and I'll put the links in if you want to try to make these yourself. Took the, uh, I took the breakthrough boards, and I scanned the metal track of the breakthrough board. Got that image into an editor, and I basically made, a, I basically made an image that was 8.5 by 11, that the whole page was these things was the, the images from the metal track. The, the Americans, the British, the German, um, and the Russian all came from the breakthrough boards. And there's actually pretty clean images on the breakthrough boards for doing this. The Japanese one I had to take from, um, I believe it was Kalkin Ghoul. So the Japanese ones are, are just not just a little bit less sharp than the other ones. The other ones look like pretty good because the image I started with was good. But um, so I scanned those, got them into the editor, made a full page of them, and I printed them on sticker paper. And then I got uh, a whole a hole punch from Amazon that was this size. And believe it or not, it just worked out that the actual images on the breakthrough boards to make these was exactly one and a quarter inches. So it, and the, and the, the blank part of the chip is one and a quarter inches. So it, it couldn't have been more perfect. It was like, I really didn't even, I didn't have to resize or do any of that. I just scanned them, copied them until I had a full page of it, printed them all out. They're double sided. So I printed a hundred. I've, I've got 50 of each of the chips. And that's that's enough for pretty much any standard scenario, any breakthrough scenario, and really any overlord scenario because I've got I have two base games and I have one of each of the other expansions. 
So if I need to, I'll do like two chips and then two figure, two plastic figures from the expansion. So um, that's how I did it, and they turned out really nice. And when I first was getting started, I got some like El Cheapo plastic chips, and then a buddy of mine that I was playing with at the time, he brought some real casino chips like these over. And I was like, oh yeah, I gotta get these. But I knew I wanted to be custom. I didn't really want, I didn't want like the the card suits around the outside of the edge, or I didn't want them to be like yellow with purple and red and little spots on the edges and stuff like that. So when I found these blank chips on Amazon, uh, it was it was great. So. And then the color choices, I mean, I, I made the allies green because the plastic figures are green. I made the axis black because the figures are gray and like, I mean, not really, but like black is evil or something, you know, whatever. <laughs> and then I made the Japanese red. I had originally thought that I was going to make the Soviets red and the Japanese yellow and I don't know. I I didn't really I didn't like the look of the of the red um metal image on the on the yellow uh chip. And to be honest, I was kind of thinking like you know, back in the day and you know, like it being kind of racist to say that Japanese people were yellow. I mean, I don't really think that would matter for some poker chips and I don't think anybody would be offended, but I did kind of have that thought in my mind, like, well, if I make the Japanese yellow, I might hear it from some internet meanie or whatever. So <laughs> I made the Japanese red and it works out because the, you know, the Japanese flag is a, is a red circle on a white field and, um, and the Russian, you know, the Russian one being yellow is, you know, the hammer and sickle on the flag is yellow. So um, and it just looks better. The, the gray on the yellow and the red on the red just look better. So, and then the British was easy. It's purple. So I just made them blue. Um, but that's it for the chips. Like I said, I'll give you a close up image and I'll put links to the stuff if you actually want to try to make these, but it's basically scan the images, put them on sticker paper, punch them out, peel them. It was tedious. I mean, it was, it was tedious, but they're quite nice. And especially if you're using plexiglass like I do, you can just slide them around. So I know you've seen that in other videos, but uh, yeah, that's it for the chips. Next, I'll talk about the dice towers. Okay, so the dice towers. Originally, I started out, excuse me, originally I started out with two of these, just plain ones. I don't really remember where I got them. They're, they're the ones that are birch plywood. If you look for birch dice tower, this is what comes up. So... And so before I build them, I put green felt on all of the surfaces that would be, uh, that the dice would be hitting because I heard that um, I put it together dry and then I dropped some dice in and it was really loud. And sometimes I play at night, my girlfriend's sleeping. So I just did the felt. It looks better and, it, and it, uh, it's not as loud. So originally the idea was I was going to have this and I was going to make this one a German World War II era camo, the same way this one is. And I just never got around to it. Um, I was going to have, you know, the Allies was going to use this one and the Axis were going to use that one when we were playing, but it just didn't work out like that. I just decided I'd rather just have one, uh, one dice tower that we, that both players dropped the dice into. So I, um, so I made this and originally you know these these dice towers are kind of deep so when you drop the, when you drop the dice in without putting something in the bottom to raise it up a little bit you have to sort of look over into there so and I, that was another thing i didn't like with these um, i fixed that since but um, originally when i built this you know i just cut a hex and then put some walls on it and same deal it's just foam core and it's got that green sticky felt from the craft store on it. And originally, I'll take a close up picture so you can see better, but originally it was this tall. It was just this lower one. And um, it, wasn't, it wasn't tall enough. The dice were rolling and jumping out because that's only, 
you know, that's only as tall as a dice. And once they hit this and start to bounce around, they'll just jump out. So then I built this higher wall around the whole thing, and then that solved that. And um, I knew that I still wanted to use one of these, so I just built this little box and glued it on, and then that fits on there. And that's that's what I'm using in all my videos. I think one of the videos you can see this that that this is my setup. But um, yeah, that's excuse me, that's pretty much it. This was uh, the same deal. I just found the image from Google Images and made a page of it and printed it on sticker paper and then just stuck it out and cut it to size so um, yeah that's how I did that and it works really good it's um yeah I like it I like this setup I like how it sounds it's not all rattly and stuff so yeah that's it for the dice towers so again I know it's they're too small to see from from this far but I'll put some close-up pictures of them it's basically uh, I use these to mark who's shooting if if a if a unit just moves and doesn't shoot, they don't get one of these. I just then I can just move on and ignore them because I know they're not shooting. But if a unit moves and then sh is going to shoot, I put one of those on. And all it is is like a generic crosshair image. And again, same thing. I found the image, saved it, got it into an editor, copied it a bunch of times, and printed it on sticky paper and or sticker paper, I should say. And then stuck that to some chipboard and then use an X-Acto knife uh, to cut them out so that they would fit into these little holders nicely. Um, I forget where I got the holders. I think I got those from a German company. They might have come from Amazon too, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, that's about it. They work really good. You know, they're kind of tall once they're on the board and, you know, the crosshairs are it's fairly obvious what it means, you know, so, uh, but that's about it. You know, same thing, image and sticker paper stuck on the chipboard, cut it out with an X-Acto knife and put it into the little token holder. So uh, again, I'll put, uh, you know, I'll put up a close up picture of it so you can, you know, once you see it up close, you'll be able to make, work it out for yourself how I did it. It's not, it's not that tough. All right, so that's the activation tokens. Okay, so this is more of a storage thing than a custom, you know, bling or whatever. I, I don't like the word bling, but that's what people call it. So, um, but yeah, so I've got um, in this one early on, um, early on, I printed my own set of summary cards because I didn't want to buy the air, the air pack, the original air pack. So, I went on to the card compendium, I saved all the images, I changed them to 300 DPI with an editor so that I could get them printed. And then, uh, so I got, I actually got two complete sets of summary cards printed and I was keeping them in a, basically like a, like a baseball card box or whatever. Um, and I really didn't like that, I was kind of having to dig through them a lot and so anyway, what I did was this. I got these. Uh, I got these card holder binder pages, and so I have. I ended up buying the air pack, of course, because I wanted the cards. So, um, so I basically have in this binder for for every for every summary card. I've got the original one from the air pack or. Winter Wars or where Sword of Stalingrad, wherever it came from. And then I've got the second one that I got, one of the sets that I got printed. One of the sets I got printed, I had no border. You, you maybe can't see that, but there's no black border on that. And then another set I got printed with the border. And the border just added too much and made the images too small. So I like the one without the border. But, um, you know, so I've got the nations there. And then these, this starts with the terrain. Um... And then I've got, you know, and even like the custom ones like Deep Frozen Rivers, which I think came from the Dutch Open. I just, I made one for those. I think, I think the Deep Frozen River one, I just printed on sticker paper and stuck it to a, to a, to a, uh, a junkie card that I had laying around or whatever. Um, yeah, so you get the idea with this. And the ones from D-Day, uh, I think I got from Vassal. 
Um, I made one myself. I made one for Leathernecks. You know, if you see a Leatherneck card out there, is, I, I designed it. It's not great, but <laughs> I'm just saying. So yeah, SWAs and like the air pack cards and the new flight plan cards and all that, I, I don't have in here. This is just a, this is just the regular stuff, so. And then another storage thing for a binder is the tokens. So I got these coin pages off eBay. And I think, I know a lot of people are using these, so this is probably not a surprise, but um, yeah, they're just, they're coin pages. They're supposed to be for coin collectors, but the tokens fit perfect in them. So they're a little, I mean, it's a little bit of a, you have to kind of pinch them from the bottom to get them out of there. And some people don't want to deal with that and think it's a pain. And really, honestly, getting them back in is more of a problem because the way these are cut, there's one side that's sharp and there's one side that's not sharp. And if you're trying to put it in with the sharp side up, it just kind of wants to fight against that plastic as you're sliding them in. So, yeah, so I got the base game, terrain pack, you know, Eastern, Pacific. I think these are Winter Wars. And I've gone through here. I used to have, when you, when you, you when you, Originally when I bought these they came with They came with a sheet of paper that had like a grid on it where you could write down on the grid what they were and so I had pages between there that said what they were but And I didn't mark every single one. I just said like okay Eastern Front from here to here or, or you know here to here is Eastern Front on the on the page it was underneath but I flipped through here so many times that I know where they're at and I know what they are so um yeah that's uh these are these are d-day and then i think these are the jungle and desert because i got the spider hole ones and then these i got made uh custom out again i'll show a close-up picture of them it's basically these are for when it's a temporary metal for for both sides so the metal itself is like cut right in half it's like half the German symbol and half the American and I got them for each one. I've got German American Japanese American British German British Japanese like any any combination of who's going to be fighting who I've got a medal that will match the scenario and it, this, this is just a thing but I didn't really like to have two tokens on there. It just is you can get confused like you take one of the metals off you got to hide the other one but then if the metal goes back on you got to put them both back on i didn't like that so these are i know they do this in the dutch open where they just have they have metals that are the same you know like both countries on one metal so i got those made i wasn't happy with the quality i forget where i got them done and i sent them an email saying these aren't very good they're cut wrong and all that and the guy basically said, if you want them to be nice, you got to pay more. <laughs> so they were super cheap. I mean, really, it was like 10 or 15 bucks to get all these. So I can't really complain that much. They work for what they are, you know. And then those are just the base game ones there at the back. But yeah, that's, that's it for the cards and tokens. I keep them in binders. It just makes it a lot easier. So this one is just a tip, really, for people that use plexiglass. When I started using plexiglass, I started running into what, well, like what to do with bridges or um, like an exit token that's really not going to be removed from the game. But if you put the terrain hex and then you put the token on top of the terrain, um, then you put the plexiglass on, it's not flat. <laughs> so basically what I did was if, if you have, you know, I just photocopied I just color copied and put the ones I need on paper. So like, you know, instead of having a hex that's whatever, two millimeters tall, I just have this paper and then I'll just put the, uh, I'll put the bridge or whatever on top of the paper. Then when I put the plexiglass on, it's level. It's level with everything else and there's no bulges in the plexiglass. So that's really just a little, uh, you know, just a little tip. You know, if you're going to have, you know, say your road is at the edge of the board and you've got the exit marker like that, then you put the plexiglass on top of that. So that's just a little trick when I started using the plexi. I mean, obviously, if it's something like a, a bunker that can be destroyed or a bridge that can be blown up or whatever, I'll just put the actual 
token on the top of the plexiglass and deal with it. I think I've done that in a scenario that I've played on here. So, but yeah, that's it for that. That's just a little tip. And then, so I've got like, and then another one is like, if you come across stuff on scenarios from the front where they have like, uh, 40 jungle hexes on, on the board or something, I just have made like, I forget there was a breakthrough or something where I needed a bunch of jungle hexes and didn't have them. Cause I only have one copy of the Pacific theater. So I just made a bunch of copies. So if I, you know, and, and the Japanese towns, like I like them to all look the same. So if a, if a breakthrough scenario calls for like six Japanese towns and there's only three or four in the base game or in the Pacific theater expansion, I just photocopy them and use those. And if, and if I, uh, if you just set that on top of another tile, it keeps it all level. Like I was talking about with the with the exit tokens or the bridges or whatever. So that's it. That's just a little tip. I mean, it's not a, I'm sure people can figure that out for themselves, but it's something that I did that I thought might be handy for, for some people. So yeah, make photocopies of the hexes. <laughs> Pretty easy. <laughs> okay. Another thing I've done is, uh, this is really just kind of a storage thing, but I early, I don't know if I, if knowing what I know now, I don't think I would have done this. Um, originally. But what I did was I got online and I found all the free scenario compilations I could. Some are from Derek Whaley. Some are from uh, like the campaign book one that you can buy. And most are from the Days of Wonder site. And I just basically got, got all those files and compiled them. And so this one, for example, uh, I, I got all these done from printerstudio.com. So. so this one is uh, the Audie Murphy campaign. It's got uh, the invasion of Crete, I think. Yeah, invasion of Crete. Um, Brumbar's D-Day campaign, which is really cool. It's got the equipment pack additional scenarios. Those are available online for free. The VE day scenarios, that's four scenarios with a Silo uh, Heights Overlord. That's a really popular one. Vercor campaign. Um, and then this one is actually the air pack scenarios. At the time I didn't have, uh, um, at the time I didn't have the air pack. So I bought the PDF that you can get online and uh, basically just printed it in book form. And yeah, so that's that one. You know, I don't know if I really need to show you all these. I think you get the idea. This one's the new flight plan bonus scenarios. Uh, these are all like the actual rule books from the expansions. I got campaign book two and the air book, the air pack uh, manual in there. This one's the big one. This is the Derek Whaley. Whaley Land is his username if you want to look it up. But it's, it's basically every up until when he made this, it was like every official scenario that was available online that's not classified. So he's got Western Front, Eastern Front, his breakthroughs and everything. It's, it's basically every scenario up to this point that was official scenario that was available online. Um, so that, you know, I got that printed. That's pretty cool. And then this one, oh, that's just the campaign book one that I got the I bought the PDF from Days of Wonder and printed that out. So um, that's another thing I did early on. On to be honest, I don't really use these. I use the campaign book one, but if I'm going to do a scenario, generally I'll just look it up and print it out or something. Um, I I did use them when I first made them and got them, but over time now I just I just look online and to be honest it's kind of a waste of paper because they're all everything in there is available online anyway so like I said if I had to do over again I probably wouldn't do that but they're cool and at some point I'm gonna give them to somebody or whatever so uh, yeah but that's it that was one thing I did early on that like I said looking back I'm not I don't think was was that, that creative uh, of an idea but it was cool at the time Man, getting these in the mail and opening them up was like I just had started playing. It was, it was really exciting. So, all right, on to the next thing. I think we're just about done here. I got a couple more little things I want to say. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna wrap it up here with storage, just general storage. I've, I've gone back and forth on these Acro Mills boxes. It's the Acro Mills 5905. Um, when I first saw these, people using these, I loved the idea, I thought it was great. So I got some, I put everything in there, and excuse me, for whatever reason, I didn't like it. I didn't like how deep the, the pockets were. I don't know, I just didn't like them. And, and I like the idea of the actual boxes. You know, you're looking at that, when you see that on a shelf, it's a lot more impressive than just a craft, a craft box, you know. So I, I made these, I took the, the sleeve that goes onto the box, I took that off, cut it with an X-Acto knife, and glued the pieces onto the box so you don't have to take the box off the shelf and slide it out of the sleeve, open it, do, do your stuff. And, and then I also made, um, I made little foam core inserts for each one. The hexes would go here, the chips would go here, the infantry, the tanks, um, the tokens, uh, this one's the Mediterranean, so the uh, so the the bazookas, the anti tank goes in here, you know, little ones for the tokens. So, and I made one for every one, every every one of these winter wars, everything. And then uh, over time, it's like, and when I I think I think it was the new flight plan that finally broke me of these things, because the new flight plan is like pretty much every scenario you need three or four expansions. So I was, you know, okay, I, now I need the British troops. So I open this up, take the chips out, take the guys out. And uh, then you, okay, I'm done with that one. Okay, now I need some Russian stuff. So you open, you know, and it just got to be more of, more of a pain than I wanted to deal with. So I went back to the Acro Mills boxes and I'm going to stick with this. I think this is really the way to go because now I've got one for chips, I've got one for tiles, and I've got one for armies. And everything I would need to set up a scenario is in these three tubs. This one's the equipment pack, the tokens, and the cards. And honestly with the cards, just in the last couple games, I've kind of realized that most of them I don't even need because I have them in my, in my memory. Um, so really, Really, this right here, I can set up pretty much any scenario that that I want to or that I can with what I have available. So, and you know, I've got D-Day on the shelf and all that, but that's that's separate. So, I'm back to the Acro Mills boxes. You know, I got two two base games: uh, Eastern Front, Pacific Theater, Terrain Pack, Winter Wars, and Mediterranean Theater. And uh, I've got the air pack tiles somewhere else. I think they're in the air pack box. The token box, um, I basically, I made this foam core box to hold the tokens. And it just wasn't, uh, just wasn't like strong enough. So I got a plastic tub. I couldn't find one that fit that because it's, it's an odd shape. It's, it's an odd size. So then I just got this green foam. This is the green foam that you put fake flowers into when you're making an arrangement or whatever. And just cut it so that it would hold that so it doesn't jump around in there. And this one, the lid doesn't fold all the way back, which is a slight annoyance, but not that big of a deal. I do like the, the clasps on this one better than these. Um, these. These Acro Mills, you really have to kind of work that to get it where it like wants to close on some of them so um, but still not that's first world problem for sure and then uh, this one's all the armies again it's two base games here tanks infantry um, obstacles wire and sandbags and whatever all of the artillery these are allies artillery axis artillery eastern front uh, mediterranean and pacific theater um, and then finally Last but not least, I've got all of the boards in one of these magazine boxes. These are the two breakthrough boards. Those are my two base game boards. And this is the winter desert. So 
that's pretty much the perfect size <laughs> and uh, even if I had to go somewhere to play, which I usually don't, this would be fine to take as long as I could keep it upright, you know. But if I was playing somewhere, I would just figure out what I wanted to play and just take one board with me. But this is this is great, you know. This and then the, the other magazine holder full of all the books looks looks nice on the shelf and all that. So I think that's about it for this one. Um, I had a little list here. Uh, yeah, the card box I could just mention real quick. I got this on eBay, and again, it's really just like a baseball card box. But I've got all the combat cards, break two breakthrough decks, um, two base game decks, some uh, the base game summary cards that I didn't put in the binder. I got the Overlord deck, and then one deck of breakthrough cards that I that I made. So. <laughs> But yeah, that's about it. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. And I hope this was helpful. And I've gotten I've gotten questions about the uh, about the chips more than anything. The chips and the activation tokens are are two things that people really want to know about. So that's why I put those up front um, at the beginning. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you on the next one. And take it easy.